Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this edition of Grassroots Racing Show. Welcome to the Grassroots Racing Show. I'm Doug Thompson with co-host Roger Thompson. Roger, it's hard to imagine, but we're starting the 2013 Grassroots Racing season. This is the inaugural show for this year, and it seems like uh, it hadn't been that long ago that we did the first one and stumbled through the first series of shows, and, and I can't believe now we're into the third year of it already. I can't believe we're into the 20th century already. This is amazing to me. Did you say 2013? Yeah, 2013. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, listen, what we've got going this year, the new show's got a little bit of a different format. And uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to visit a little bit about uh, Dave Marcus, who a uh, NASCAR star that came through the Auto Racing Museum recently. But I want to talk a little bit about the uh, format for the Grassroots Racing Show for 2013. One of the things we're doing is we've revamped a little bit so that we can do a little bit like the ESPN Sports Center to where we have updates from tracks. And we're going to have uh, Lakeside Speedway out of Kansas City and Heartland Park going to be one of our featured tracks, uh, 81 Speedway, uh, with our old buddy um, Warren Hardy, the voice of 81 Speedway. Oh, Warren's always a lot of fun. Oh, he is. This uh, is the 21st century, by the way. Oh, well, yeah, but well, I didn't crack you on it oh, yet, thanks. but you took care of that yourself. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then uh, we're going to have uh, Salina Speedway is going to be involved in it, and RPM Speedway, and probably several others, but uh, at least those that we know of some tracks have it's winter time for them, so they haven't made the commitment yet. But the format's basically going to be that we'll get uh, results coming in on a two-minute um, review from each of those tracks. And we'll drop that in at the beginning of each show. And then we're going to do, just like we did last year with Mike Kraft, we're going to do a lot of racing footage. And Mike Kraft, as a matter of fact, he's in Florida right now at uh, Speed Week shooting film for the Grassroots Racing Show. And so we'll have uh, racing action from East Bay and, um, and several other parks in the uh, Daytona area. And I think that's going to be a good show. I forgot to tell you, the, um, the uh, vintage antique racers are having another Nationals at Belleville on the 27th and 28th of July, like they did a couple years ago when they tie up everything in the museum. Boy, they had 103 cars out there. Yeah, I remember uh, that was a big event. Oh, yeah, and if we could get Mike out there with the uh, in-car cameras, and oh, that'd be they great. had an Indy car and a bunch of old Sprint cars and some uh, early Indianapolis, 1918 yeah. cars there. Just from They came from all over the country. Did I you, just thought about that. Did you race up there last year? Did you drive no, they didn't calls? even race last they didn't, year. They just, no. just had before. the show, car show. Yeah, well, that'd be great. because but it was a year before they had the Colorado and the Kansas groups put it on. That was two years ago. And then they didn't do it last year, and now they're going to do it again this year. But, uh, boy, we had a great time there. And those old guys, those cars really zipped around that yeah. track. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember you telling me about it. Well, uh, one of the things we had happen here at the Auto Racing Museum, we're, of course, located at the, the Kansas Auto Racing Museum, located just off I-70 at the Chapman exit. And by the way, I should have mentioned at the beginning, we have a brand new sponsor, Sentinel Buildings. And at this auto racing complex, we have three Sentinel Buildings. We have two more coming, building the Chapman Food Mart next to it. And we're also adding on to the museum a 70 by 60 building that's a Sentinel Building. And so we'll be using that as the, the new Sentinel Building uh, studio for the uh, grassroots racing show. You mean we get a real studio? Yeah, we'll have a real studio. We have a real studio now. If you, if we turn the camera now, you would see the lighting, the banks of lighting, and a lot of things that have oh, happened yeah. here. So it's a, it's a really neat spot. Yeah, and, this is uh, a good spot. This is a lot of fun doing it right here in the museum. Yeah, it is. And speaking of being in the museum, here not too long ago, I was in the office working, and you know, I have a window that goes from my office out into the museum. And I saw this guy walking around in the museum, and I, it's one of those, you know, when I, you see him, I said, who is that guy? I should know that guy. I can't think of who he is. Where do I know him from? Well, I didn't recognize him at the time, and I was busy, so I didn't pay a whole lot of attention other than he was wearing the Goodyear hat and just one guy by himself. So it happened to be I was coming out of the uh, office as he was getting ready to leave the museum, and I got talking to him, and I said, uh, uh, where are you from? And he said, well, I'm from Wisconsin. And uh, I said, well, what you doing this way? And he said, I'm going to go hunting out in uh, Colorado, going elk hunting with some buddies. And uh, I said, you must be a real racing fan. And, you know, he said, yeah, yeah, I used to be. And I said, at what level? And he said, NASCAR. And I said, really? Well, how long? 
Put oh, yeah, I was, in yeah, dirt, I was, I was all over that one, wasn't I? <laughs> guy that owns a museum. And, <laughs> and so I said, uh, for how long? And he said, uh, 35 years. And I said, well, what's your name? And he says, uh, Dave Marcus. And I said, really? And Don't so you wish you had started this story with his name and you wouldn't have looked No, I didn't, so I didn't, you know, I didn't, no, I didn't <laughs> mind looking stupid. I do that a lot. So, but uh, we wound up talking for about an hour, hour and a half. And then that led to some uh, interviews that you're going to hear in a little bit where I interviewed Dave Marcus and he had a fantastic racing career. Met him in Daytona and he had the story with the black wingtips and it was a situation where he said, he told the other racers, I'm burning my feet. And Dave Pearson said, well, you got those black wing tips. Why don't you put those on? He said, those are dress shoes. And he said, put them on. You won't burn your feet. And that became his trademark, the black wing tips. And you'll hear all about what he did with NASCAR. We're going to be back when we come back. You'll get to visit with Dave Marcus with me. I'm Ken Tatro, and you're watching the Grassroots Racing Show on my favorite network. Welcome back to the Grassroots Racing Show. I'm Doug Thompson, and our special guest today is certainly one of my favorite NASCAR racers, Dave Marcus. And let me just give you some stats on Dave, because we've got Dave on the phone with us. Uh, uh, Dave ran 881 NASCAR races, 14 poles, five wins, and that doesn't count one. He jumped into the seat for Bobby Allison and won. 93 top fives, 221 top tens, Eight, time he finished, eight times he finished in the top ten in points. Twice he was uh, in the top five. He was second to Richard Petty in 1975. Ran his first race in uh, the NASCAR series was the uh, 1968 Daytona 500. And you talk about a guy that uh, got in there and did it, and did it without an army of, of uh, mechanics and sponsorship, and that's Dave Marcus. I got the chance to meet Dave at the Daytona 500 when... We were down there, and he was wearing his famous wingtips. He was down on the floor welding a header, and I just got a chance to say hi. I wanted to jump in and say, can I help you, Dave? But I figured he had help, but uh, in retrospect, I suppose he didn't. Well, Dave, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on. And did I get your stats right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, I am amazed about it because, you know, we watch the NASCAR racing now, and, of course, I raced in the series nowhere near the level you did. I raced in the Goodies Dash series and then the Craftsman Truck series. But I know what it takes, and I know how many people we had working on to make this happen, and I cannot imagine how you could do this basically by yourself. How did you do it? Well, you know, I had a lot of friends that would, would come and help, and I had people... Uh, just, just race fans in general are super nice people, and, and I meet uh, many, many folks all across the United States running the NASCAR series because of all the different states that we traveled in. And I had different people in every area that would come and help us uh, pit the car on the weekends and stuff like that. And, and you know, that they practice, and it meant a lot to them to get the opportunity to, to come into pits and things. I'd help them out with their food and their motel rooms, and... Uh, uh, it's just, it's one of those deals that I wanted to do. I wanted to race for a living, and uh, uh, I decided I would go to NASCAR because uh, being from Wisconsin, it was difficult to do it through the winter months, and uh, I think NASCAR was, was the choice because it's not as seasonal. You know, we start racing in February and run into November. So uh, it, just, uh, it just all fell together, and, and uh, I had a couple full-time employees, and... Uh, uh, it's just something I wanted to do, and as uh, Jim Sauter, I know a lot of people have heard of Jim, and Jim has always had a saying that uh, you got to want to, and if you want to, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, how did you get into racing to begin with before you went to NASCAR? Well, my dad had a garage and a wrecking yard in Wisconsin, so it was around automobiles a lot. We also lived on a farm, so a lot of machinery, tractors, and things, and uh my brother and I, we'd take cars out of that wrecking yard that my dad had when him and Mom were gone on the weekends, and we'd run them in the fields there on the farm and get in trouble when they got back home, of course. But uh, just just being around automobiles and monkeying with them, and then uh, uh, we had a little old dirt track in uh, Wausau, Wisconsin, called State Park Speedway, and uh, I took an old 49 Ford. That was one of my first race cars, and... Uh, we put some roll bars in it, and we took it out there to see if we could race, and that's where it all started. Man, that's quite a jump from going to the uh, out of the uh, wrecking yard, building some race cars, going to a little dirt track in Wisconsin, and then scratching your head a little bit and saying, you know what, I think I'll go to Daytona and race. How'd that come about? Well, 
you know, I guess I ran 10 years in Wisconsin, and I was uh, pretty successful in Wisconsin racing there. I ran with Dick Trickle and Marv Marzufka, and, the, you know, we had some really good racers up there, and and um, I just decided, like I say, I wanted to do it for a living, so I chose NASCAR as to be the place to do it. Uh, I did run some IMCA late model shows, and they traveled around the country in the summertime to the fairs and things. I was successful in some of those races. Uh, I didn't run all that many of them, but um, I, I just uh, have a friend in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Larry Weirs of Weirs Chevrolet mm -hmm. in Bangor, Wisconsin, and uh, Larry helped me buy the first car that we took to Daytona, uh, and we actually went down there to run the ARCA race. Um, we ran in it, and uh, someone blew a clutch or something, and it went through our radiator and knocked us out of the race. And, you know, we kind of thought, well, we were done. We were loading our stuff up, and someone come over from the NASCAR garage and said, you know, you guys could uh, enter that car in the Daytona 500. It's uh, still is uh, not the entry deadline yet, and you have a week to put it through inspection before the 500. So I went over there and inquired about that, and yes, that was possible to do, and uh, so so we did. We took it over to the NASCAR side, and of course we had to disassemble it, magna flux it and everything, and go through it, uh, meet all the NASCAR uh, safety regulations and things, and uh, we, we did that, and in our first Daytona 500, I believe we finished, uh, I think it was 18th. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, at that time, um, they paid uh, prize money for the highest finishing automobile of that type. And yeah, I had a Chevrolet at that time. And the only other Chevrolet in there was uh, Bob Seneker from uh, Michigan. Yeah. And uh, I thought, well, you know, if we could if we could be the highest finishing Chevrolet, that'd be an extra thousand dollars, which that was super big money to me because coming off the short tracks in Wisconsin, you know, we got paid a hundred dollars, hundred twenty-five, hundred fifty, things like that. So, uh, but but Bob ended up beating me. I think he finished thirteenth. I might have finished eighteenth. But that was the start of uh, thirty-five years of racing in NASCAR. Yeah, and that's amazing. I had the chance to race against Bob, a very very good racer and a very nice guy. I'm sure you found that to be the case. Oh yes, definitely. Well, that's quite a time. What did you get for uh, 18th in the Daytona 500? You know, I don't remember exactly what that what that first paid, but uh, my wife does have, it, have <laughs> records of all of that. Well, it was uh, a lot. You know that. It felt pretty well, good yeah, to you. In comparison, right. I'm, I'm sure it was a couple thousand dollars at least. And, yeah. And, uh, in comparison, yeah. And, uh, and I recall we went to Bristol, Tennessee. Uh, shortly after that, and I finished 13th, and uh, a lot of guys said, well, 13 is bad luck. Well, I think I made pretty close to $1,000 there that day, and uh, that wasn't bad luck for me. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, I had a lot of money when you're used to racing for 100. We're going to take a quick break, Dave, and we're going to be right back after we uh, cut away for some commercials and pay some bills. Stay tuned. We're talking to Dave Marcus. This is Scotty Anderson, and you're watching my favorite show, Grassroots Racing. Welcome back to the Grassroots Racing Show. I'm Doug Thompson. On the phone with me is NASCAR star Dave Marcus. And Dave, we were talking about uh, your Daytona 500 adventure. How did the NASCAR, the regulars, you know, the Petty, Pearson, uh, Yarborough, how did Allison, how did all those guys uh, accept you into the circle? Because you were not, you were not from the South, and and uh, what they were familiar with, certainly. Well, I felt like I was welcomed. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I was from the north and considered a Yankee, and uh, but I mean, everyone was very nice. Uh, Richard Petty come over and congratulated me uh, in the NASCAR and coming and giving it a try, and he looked my car over, and uh, uh, you know, of course, Bobby Allison was a guy that did a lot of work on his cars and stuff, and. Uh, Bobby helped me, and I asked information of all of those people, of Bobby and Richard, David Pearson, Donnie Allison, uh, uh, and everyone seemed very helpful. I, I felt as though I was welcome into the sport. Well, you had to be in that, and what that tells me is the same thing you knew very soon is that you had their respect, and when you earn their respect, then they will help you. They'll share information with you. That's why there are people who were down there that said, I, I want to be a part of his crew, even if it's only for that weekend. 
but uh, that's because they respected the effort you put in. I think that I find throughout the country all over, dirt track racers, asphalt, wherever it may be, everybody's willing to help each other, and that's one great thing about the sport of automobile racing. Yeah, it, it is. And speaking of automobile racing, you got to be kind of the one that was in charge, the test driver of one of the most difficult series to do because uh, the IROC series, which was the International Race of Champions, takes a, a dozen cars and, and probably some backup cars, and your job is to make those cars absolutely even so it makes no difference which driver is in that car. That car performs the same. Now, how the driver handles may be different, but uh, that was a tough task. Yeah, it was, and I've done that for over 30 years, and, and, and I was proud to have that job. That actually helped keep me in business many years in my NASCAR program, but uh, what we did, we, we had 12 identical race cars, and, of course, we had four backup cars in case they had problems or wrecked some during the week, but our job was to set those cars up and get them all equal, and, and we worked extremely hard at it. Jay Signori, the, the hit uh, man of the IROC series, uh, uh, numerous hours of keeping records and and uh, you know we just it was a, we would take an engine out of a fast car and put in a slower car to make sure that it was wasn't the body or it was the engine and they they worked hard on the dynos to try and get the engines all equal and and I think it was a very good series and we always tried to keep in mind the drivers that actually weren't stock car drivers. Uh, had a little harder time adjusting to the stock cars than they did some of the cars that they drove. Some of the examples would be like the IROC cars weighed 3,500 pounds. So when you get an IndyCar driver in an IROC car, he's used to a 1,300-pound car with bigger tires, probably a softer compound, more downforce. So getting in that stock car probably felt like, like getting on into a tank or something. Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, uh, there was kind of no comparison as far as the weight and the acceleration and the stopping and all that. So we always tried to keep in mind that we needed to adjust those cars and get those guys comfortable in those cars. The stock car drivers usually were always able to adapt to it because that's what they were used to. So uh, that's what we worked very hard on doing, and, and that always made it a very interesting and a close race and kept it a very good series, well-respected series. And you had to take the chassis, and you're the one that actually set up the chassis, aren't you? Yeah, I made, like, most all the final decisions on what springs we would run, what sway bars and things like that. And, you know, a lot of times some, some of the stock car drivers would, uh, would get upset with some of the decisions that I would make. But, again, I, I bring up that we were trying to get the Indy car guys and the Formula One car guys and the sprint car guys comfortable in those cars. We weren't all that worried. The stock car drivers were knowledgeable with that type of equipment, and they could adjust and adapt to it. Yeah, yeah, I can see where they would. And then uh, did the drivers have some feedback with you, or they would come in and say, hey, here's the way I would really like my car set up, or did they, uh, the setups were virtually identical? setup was identical on all the cars. We listened to the feedback from the drivers, and and we tried to get uh, what they wanted during the week, but uh, but we would never fine-tune a car for an individual. All the cars were equal. They all had the same sway bars, the same springs, as close as we could get them in the spring raider, and, and the same shock absorbers, and the same ride heights. All that uh, was equal. Yeah. So it's kind of one of those days where the driver would come up and say, I'd like to see this done and this done, and you would nod on him and shake your head like, yeah, I understand. And then he'd walk away, and you'd do what you needed to do anyway. Well, yeah, that was kind of the bottom line. <laughs> but, I mean, if some of them wanted some input, and we had three or four guys kind of asking for the same thing, well, then we didn't have no problem changing the race cars. Like if they wanted a little different cast or a camber, uh, and, and if four or five of them were asking for that, uh, then we would get the feeling that, well, then the car maybe needs to go that way. So that then we would do it. But we would have to do it to the entire field. Uh, we didn't do it to just one particular car. Yeah, yeah, I can see where that would make it an unlevel playing field. I know later in your career, uh, or I should say later in uh, Dale Earnhardt's career, he wanted to spend more time away from the track, and you were selected as the one who actually came in, set up his cars uh, for him. Am I right about that? 
Yeah, I did a, quite a bit of testing for Dale. Uh, Neil Bonnet used to do a, a, quite a bit of it. He and uh, Richard and Dale were very close friends. And uh, uh, when we lost Neil, then uh, I was close friends with Dale and Richard also. And then they got me to start testing for Dale because Dale just hated to test. He just, I don't know, he just didn't like to test. And, yeah. and uh um, so I, I done a lot of that testing, and I, I was real proud to be able to be the guy that set that car up that Dale won, the, finally won the Daytona 500 with. Yeah, I remember hearing Dale say that, uh, that much of that success for, for what he was having was because you were setting it up. And Well, Dave, I can't believe we're out of time already, but listen, when you're back up in this area, stop on in. I'd love to visit with you again, and uh, uh, in an earlier segment on here, I'll visit a little bit about the uh, wingtips, and I'll tell the folks the story about the wingtips because you've already told me that one. Dave Marcus, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, and remind everybody to say a prayer for all of our troops in all the foreign countries. Ah, but well put, Dave. You take care and God bless you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for staying with us for the Grassroots Racing Show Night at the Track. The 2013 racing season is just beginning at most of the local tracks. For this show, we're going back to October of 2012 for some great racing action at Lakeside Speedway for the late model shootout. The racing was just too good not to show, so don't go away. When we come back, we'll be at Lakeside with Mike Kraft. Oil MLRA feature race number 551 for the series. It is the second longest running continually operating dirt late model station in the country according to time frame. It has contested the third most amount of races of any dirt late model sanction in the country. Next year will be the silver anniversary edition for the Lucas Oil MLRA. Going to go 40 laps, 5,000 to win, $400 to start. The field bunches up, the leaders make their way through the middle of turns three and four. They're going to fire from the chalk as they enter the front straightaway. Here we go. Final race of the 2012 season. Will Vaught, Mark Dotson, they're three wide for second. Eric Turner, Justin Asplund right there as well. Brad Looney making a hard charge. He'll roll to the outside of Asplund. Tony Jackson Jr. in the 56 to the inside of the number 77. Lap number one will go to the driver out of Crane, Missouri, Will Vaughn. Mark Johnson going second, Eric Turner third. Brad Looney fourth, Justin Asplund fifth. Tony Jackson Jr. sixth, David Turner seventh, Matt Johnson eighth, John Anderson ninth. Last night's winner, Kyle Burke, here in the early going, will hold on to that tenth position. But he's got the Simpson brothers in tow right behind him. Vaughn flashes the middle of the Jumped up now into that third position. Looney started eighth to third in a lap and a half. Well, you got to wonder if he'll have anything tonight at the end of the 40 lap main event. Will Vaught holding a comfortable lead right now. Dotson exiting turn four. Yellow turn three. Yellow and we're going to have a yellow flag over in turn number three. 20, Looks like the 24 of Bill Layton involved. The one him of Ralph Moss, the eight of Sonny Finling. Chad Simpson in the 25 also involved in that accident as well. We got a multi car pile up over in turn three. Sean, did you see that? That's all I saw. So we've got two laps complete. We're going to get going one more time. Will Vaught will start the race. He'll bring along Brad Looney and Mark Dotson in tow. Brad Looney now jumped up to the second spot on the restart. Oh my, everybody hard on the loud pedal down the front straightaway. They'll roll off two down the back chute. Vaught, your leader. Looney runs second. Eric Turner in the 33X third. 
David Turner now up into that fourth spot. That'll push Mark Dotson back to fifth. David Turner started seventh. He's locked up two spots, three spots for them. Check that. And he's digging on Turner for third. Turner in that Boyer victory circle pulls to the left rear quarter panel of Eric Turner. They'll now roll back wheel to front wheel. Now they'll pull side by side, door to door through three and four. Turner, the blue 33 F next up one group higher. Drag race down the front straightway into turn one. David Turner still right there. Turner still pushing the issue. Turner now pulls away nearly a car length. Turner fights back down the back to an excellent battle for third right now between a couple of good veteran drivers. As our front two have checked out their three quarters of a straightaway ahead, the one of the 14 year front two cars. Battle there. It's a, it's a Turner Battle Royale for the third spot. Here's Eric up top, David down low, John Anderson right there, Chris Simpson right there, Mark Dotson back a couple of car lengths. Our breakaway, yellow flag, and yellow out on the racetrack. We're going to throw the caution. The number 25 of Chad Simpson, slow order in turn number four. That'll bring out our second yellow. So the caution lights are off. Six laps complete. Here we go. Oh, contact there between Eric Turner and Brad Looney on the restart. And Brad Looney will take the second spot. Chris Simpson going to restart. Simpson roll to the inside of the 33X. And David Turner on the outside of Eric Turner on turn number two. And oh, David Turner run out of real estate. They'll shuffle him back now. He'll hold on to the fifth spot. Still right there in the mix. He didn't lose too much speed. Will Bott out front. Brad Looney runs second. Third, Eric Turner. Kyle Burke now up into the sixth spot. Good run here for Kyle Burke as he started 10th, now to 6th. Bott rolls off four, eight laps to play here. We're rolling on lap number nine. Will Bott, your pole center, the highest car in passing points. One is he raced from the tail earlier on tonight to earn the top spot. Brad Looney. Started eighth, but he's definitely nailed the setup here, at least in the first quarter of the race. Here's we've got nine scoring. Now come around this time for me. Fourth of the way home. As Chris Simpson now gets a good run, he'll slide around the front of the 33X. Kyle Burke right behind Eric Turner. Burke with the 14. He'll go to the outside in turn three. As it rolls through the middle of the corner, off four. You have Kyle Burke now in fourth position. So we got a. Uh, Battle up run, a good battle for third, fourth, and fifth. The center Turner's right there as well, not going away. Boy, Kyle Burke looks fast, his race car coming to him. It took him a little bit last night to get up to speed, but once he did, he was absolute dynamite. Bought now down to the low, through in the middle of one and two. Looney there as well, about five car lengths or so back. $5,000 on the line this evening.
bump now, slide around the eight of Sonny Fielding Bradley, and you'll be the next to do so. Here's where it's going to get interesting in a handful of laps for Will Vaughn as he's going to have three cars right in front of him, the two of Grant Young, the 29 of Bill Coons, and also the 3K of Jason Bodenhammer. started 14th, and he's trying to make the pass for 5th. Oh my. Driver out of Marshalltown, Iowa. Absolutely barnstorming through the United States Modified Touring Series, widely regarded as the top modified division in the country. Gustin around his 14 wins in the Gressel Racing. Modified, built by Jason Hughes, also splits his time. Also does a little bit of time in a late model as well. Picked up a 25,000 a win mod race. Looking to certainly turn some heads now as he's made the pass. It appears, yes, he has for fifth. Close, fourth and fifth close. 28 down. 
Hawk completes lap 29 that time by. Now Brad Looney's put three to four car lengths back on the 14 of Burke. Feature here tonight, Lakeside Speedway. Will Vaught. Uh, Will, I wouldn't call it a Sunday drive, man, but uh, you got out front and you were just gone. Yeah, track position here means a lot. Um, we we're fortunate enough after the incident in the heat race to start on the pole, and, and uh, you know the good Lord helped me make decisions on the race car, and, and, uh, and the car was great. You know, I was being patient throughout the first of the race and kind of keeping the cars underneath me, and, and uh, you know throughout the middle when I caught lap cars, I started driving a little harder, and, and uh, you know we, we had the best car tonight. 
I was going to say, a uh, good heat race and one of the few races where somebody come up from the back and actually won. <laughs> Got up to the front and did that. But then, like say, the A-Main, boy, that track, it, it just almost looked like a mirror out there. Uh, a lot of reflection. Was, was it hard to drive on that? Was it really that much of a dry slick? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's you got to focus so much on, on your race car and keep the tires underneath you and, and not get you know, anxious on the throttle. And, and uh, it, it was one of them things that you, you just you want to do the same repetitive uh, emotion every lap. So, uh, you know, I, I thought the car, I could have been a little better. Uh, I know what to do next time I come back, but, uh, you know, yeah, it's super slick. Once again, too, it has to be kind of a special win tonight, too, with it being kind of the end of an era with uh, Cowboy and uh, Harriet uh, running the MLRA. So, man, you got to treasure this one less, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Cowboy and, and Harriet, they've they've been good to the sport. Um, and and they're, I think they're the most fair series there is out there in this region and and uh, you know I think everybody respects them and they're good people and I think I think they're still going to be around but uh, you know being Lucas bought at the series I know it's going to grow uh, I'm looking forward to running for Dan Robinson next year so uh, uh, you know I, I'm, I'm I think they got the best deal going right now you know how them things go but next year man it's going to be tougher because it always is every year but with lucas oil coming on board you know there's going to be more prize money that means boy more cars more drivers so i guess you got to go back to the shop this winter and kind of rethink things maybe uh maybe try to do it a little different or better yeah i just uh we've had a the most unlucky team that uh, i've <laughs> never been around this year we've had a lot of stuff that didn't go our way and and uh, probably cost us a few wins but uh yeah, we, we're gonna. We got one car sold already. We got to get get that car disassembled, and we got a new car gonna gonna be here in a few weeks. So we're getting ready for Arizona, and and uh, you know we'll be be ready for next year.